Am I on? Yeah, okay. Sound like I'm on out there? Yes. Okay, I can't hear myself at all, which is unusual. Maybe I got a little bit of a cold. So, uh, will you all pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, Lord, I just... I'm grateful that we could be here this morning. I'm grateful to see all these wonderful, beautiful people that you have created that are part of my, uh, my family and you, Lord. That we got here safely. And despite the snow and, and the icy roads that you got us here and that we can worship you here, Lord. I know that there is sickness going around. I mean, I hear coughing in here. I know that my wife and I are dealing with it. And there's just sickness that is prevalent right now, Lord. I ask you to bring healing. I ask you to give us strength when we don't feel good. That we be dependent upon you. And we would just call out to you and say, God, you are the great healer. And that we would heal our bodies. And for those who aren't sick here, or just thinking, man, if I could just make it through this season without getting sick, Lord, that you would protect them. We just thank you for the snow. We just thank you that it, as it comes down, it is, uh, one, killing off the stink bugs. Two, it's, it's putting snow up in the, in the mountains and, and giving us water for the coming year, which gives us our beautiful summers, Lord. And we just thank you because I know the kids are praising you and praying for more snow tonight so they don't have to go to school tomorrow. And every parent is hoping it doesn't snow that much. But Lord, we just thank you for what you have given us in this weather. It, be it snow, rain, cloudy days, or sunshine, we are grateful for every day we have here, Lord, because it's a day that we get to honor you. It's a day that we get to declare you as Lord and we get to be a witness. We get to be a witness here for you. We won't do this in heaven, Lord. We won't be able to witness to anyone anymore in heaven because we'll all be part of your family. But here on earth, this is the one thing that we get to do, the one privilege that we get while we spend our lives here on this planet. We praise you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, we're still in our series of Do Something. Talking about what is, I, I just want to do something with my life. God, what do you want me to do with my life? I want to make an impact, one that lasts longer than just uh, a few years, but one that's going to last for a, a long time, that, that we will make changes. And maybe we won't be recognized publicly, but rather that, lives of people and those lives will change other people's lives and so that's why I wanted to talk about do something but today we're going to take a little bit of a, of a turn we're going to make it some we're going to talk not so much about our core values our mission or our vision but rather what it takes to be a person to follow through and see the vision to see the vision happen see we could have a vision and we could have a mission but if we don't have the personal character to see that through, then we won't have an impact. We can have the greatest vision in the world, but if we lack what I'm going to talk about later on is moral authority, then the vision really won't go anywhere. And so we're, today we're going to be talking about our character as, a, as an individual. When I first started preparing, like God was preparing me to move. When God was saying, you are going to move, I began to get my resume together. And one of the things I did, I was like, man, my resume, I need to update this. I should go online and see if there's like any like secrets to how to make your resume better. And so I went online and looked at what, what people said about your resume. And the interesting point, one of the things that I saw continuously, website after website after website, was this, this is what one of the websites say, 90% of people who responded to the survey say they wouldn't hire someone who lied on their resume. I was like, yeah, that makes sense to me. But this was such a problem that it was on website after website after website. People said, just, just don't lie on your resume. Because if you lie on your resume, then, then we, we find out 
we're not going to hire you because we can't trust you. We need to be able to hire employees that we can trust. We need to make sure you have integrity. So the business world recognizes that integrity is important. And that's what's interesting in our core values. One of our four top core values is integrity. Integrity is important because it also affects what we're going to talk about today is our moral authority. We typically think of, uh, of different symbols that represent authority. For, like, for example, this symbol coming on up here. When you see this symbol of authority, you say, oh, this is a police person, therefore they have authority. Or if you see this one up here, you go, well, this is a bigger deal. This is the uh, FBI. So when they come knocking at your door, you know, suddenly we're like, well, you got lots of authority. But if we see this next symbol, this is probably the biggest one in the United States. When we see the symbol for the presidential seal, we go, that person has a lot of authority. While the person may have a lot of authority, whoever is president doesn't mean they have a lot of influence. See, authority does not equate influence. In fact, some of the people who have the most authority in the world have the least influence on our lives. But people, often people who seem to have very little authority, they have a huge influence on our lives. People who have influence, people who have this thing called moral authority, it's because they have deep convictions that when we look at them and go, wow, you know what, their, their life is a, in alignment with what they say they're going to do and what they actually do. All of it comes together. When you, when you have a car that's not out of alignment, you can feel it. It drifts off and you know something's not right. But when you see a person's line being in alignment, you go, wow, that, that really is impressive. That's, they say what they believe. And there's a lot of momentum behind their words. In fact, that's the kind of person I want to follow. That's the kind of person who I think is great. In fact, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to make sure that I live a life like theirs. I want to make sure that my children live lives like theirs. And, and I wanna, uh, I'm just drawn to that individual. Those are people who have moral authority. They have followers. Maybe not publicly, but people look up to them. Think about someone in your own life who you could say, you know what, that person has moral authority or, or maybe they had moral authority in your life. Maybe they have since passed away, but you look up to them. For me, it is my grandparents. Neither one of them are still alive. They, they died uh, in my early 20s, which is really quite disappointing to me because they were such a huge influence on me. They were the ones that the, the, my grandpa made sure that I learned to open the door for my grandma. I remember getting out of the car one time, and I got out, and my grandma was still in the car, and I started to walk away, and my grandpa said, excuse me? <laughs> what? what are, you, are you forgetting something? No, I'm out of the car. I closed my door. What about grandma? Oh, so I let her out. When we get back to the car, I opened up her door to let her back in. I learned from my grandfather how to be a proper gentleman. But not just how to be a gentleman. When I go spend the night at their house, every single time we had grapefruit and we read through the Bible. Now, I will tell you, I was 10 years old. I am bored to tears. But they read some devotional and I sat there like a good child eating my grapefruit. And I don't remember what they taught as far as reading the Bible goes. But I know what they taught as far as how important Scripture was in their life. So I don't remember the lessons necessary, but the biggest lesson they taught me was that God's Word is important. And that's something that influences me today. These are people who had moral authority and had influence in my life. Who's had influence in yours?
So we're going to catch up on Nehemiah. I'm not going to do the whole backstory of Nehemiah uh, as we are progressing, but I, I will tell you this. Nehemiah was a Jewish man who worked for the king of Persia who had come back to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem which had been torn down. And so they're rebuilding the walls, and he went and he got the people in the area in Jerusalem excited about rebuilding the walls, and so they began to work and rebuild the walls. In fact, these people worked so hard that they had they left their farms, they left their businesses behind just to work on the walls. When uh, as time would go on, though, they were, they were going through their grain. And because there had been a famine in the past and they didn't have a lot of grain, they began to run out of grain. So they went to the noblemen and said, Hey, we know you have storehouses of grain. We would like to purchase some for you. Well, the noblemen, being sly, shrewd men, decided to jack up the prices and make it difficult. It took as much money as they could from all the people working on the wall. In fact, the noblemen didn't help at all. But they were glad to take all the money. And then when p people didn't have any more money, the, the nobleman said, well, that's okay. We'll take your sheep. We'll take your house. We'll take your feet. They're just taking everything. And then on top of that, they are charging huge interest, interest rates on, on the people so that it comes down time for taxes to be paid because Jerusalem is a province of Persia. It becomes time for taxes. And the nobleman said, well, you know what? We would love to help you out. We know you don't have any more money. But here's what we'll do. We will take your daughters and your sons to be our slaves and then you guys can go back to work. And the people thought, wait, we're going to have this wall but we're not going to have anything else. We're going to have lost everything. And so they get upset and there's this outcry and they cry out to Nehemiah and say, Nehemiah, these people are taking advantage of us. And so Nehemiah calls a meeting. He invites all the noblemen together. I don't know if he told them that the, everybody was coming, but he invites them all together. They all show up. And then all the people in Jerusalem come up together as well to meet together. And there, in front of everybody, Nehemiah scolds. Scolds? Is that the right word? Okay. The businessmen he lays into them and they are so taken back and they are so embarrassed in front of everyone that they say okay we will give the money back we will you can have everything back and you can have the grain and they tuck their tails in and they leave and that's the last we hear from them but here's the thing how did Nehemiah do that how did he held no authority up to this point. But how did he get all the people behind him? Well, one, it's moral authority. He did have a, maybe he didn't have a position, but he had moral authority. His character was shining through already up to this point when they're rebuilding the wall. His character has shown through and people began to trust him. And the noblemen weren't loved. They had positions but they had no real moral authority or influence in these people's lives. And to add to that, Nehemiah continues over the next few years, actually over a decade, to continue to build up his moral authority so that no one can ever say anything negative about him. And that's what we're going to pick up today as we discuss what happens over the next 12 years as Nehemiah had just become at the end of last week we talked just a, a smidgen about how Nehemiah became the governor of that area and now here is Nehemiah as governor for the next 12 years and these are the things that he does over the next 12 years that continue to build up his moral authority so if you want to go and open up your Bibles we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 5 we're going to be in verse 14 if you don't have a Bible please feel free to pull out the Bible in front of you the black ones we're going to be on page page 584. I'm reading from the NASB version, which is that, those versions in the pew, and so that way it makes it easy. Uh, and then you can go ahead and pull your outlines as well. So, Nehemiah 5.14 says, Moreover from that day, I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah. From the 20th year to the 32nd year of King Artaxerxes, for 12 years 
Neither I nor the kinsmen have eaten the governor's food allowance. What does that mean? He didn't eat from the food allowance. Well, it's simple. As the governor, Nehemiah had the ability to essentially tax food. It's not that there was money associated with it, but that he would take a portion of it. So if you made five loaves of bread, one loaf would get sent up to the governor. If you collected five or 20 bushels of apples, then four of them would be sent to the governor. And this is how the governor ate. They didn't have to earn money or do anything more than that. They just collected food, a little from everybody, but it really began to add up. And so a lot of food would come in, and that's how, and the governor, if they didn't eat all the food, he could turn around and then sell the food if he chose to. So the governor had the ability to collect food, but Nehemiah, he chose not to. He said, you know what, I'm not going to collect food. I'm not going to take that tax. And this begins to build up his moral authority, and we'll discuss a little bit more why. Verse 15 goes on to say, but the former governors who were before me laid burdens on the people and took from them bread, wine, besides 40 shekels of silver. Even their servants domineered the people, but I do not do so because of the fear of God. Now, you may say, how many sh what, shekels? Okay, so how many is, is that really lay out to be? Well, this is, ends up being about one pound of silver which in today's money would be $187 and a few cents worth of silver that he would collect from each family. Now, can you imagine if he kept collecting all of that from multiple families? You could see how the governor would begin to collect a lot of money. But Nehemiah said, look, the burdens that were on the people before were so high, they couldn't bear it. The, the, the governors were collecting money. The governor was, was collecting food from them. They were already living in poverty, and yet they were taken and taking to build up wealth for themselves. And Nehemiah says, we're, I'm not going to do that. We, I'm not even going to let my servants be domineering over the people. And so, he didn't collect money for himself. Now, he would collect money for Persia, to send to the king. That's what he would do for Persia as an employee. This, so that's the tax that they would pay the government. This $187 would be in addition to the tax that they would send to Persia. This would be money that would go directly to him. So verse 16, I also applied myself to the work on the wall. So he didn't just sit around, he was working on the wall. And we did not buy any land, and my servants were gathered there for the work. Moreover, they were at the table 150 Jews and officials, besides those who come to us from the nations that were around us. Now that which was prepared for each day was one ox and six choice sheep. Also birds were prepared for me, and once in ten days all sorts of wine were furnished in abundance. Yet... For all this, I did not demand the governor's food allowance because the servitude was heavy on these people. Remember me, O God, for the good according to all that I have done for this people. Nehemiah said, not only am I not going to collect food taxes, not only am I not going to collect financial taxes, I'm not going to buy land. And I'm not going to let anybody who's working under me to buy land either. And this is significant. Because what governors would do oftentimes is they would buy land. And they would build up an estate over time. Until they had a large estate that was producing money. So when they stopped being a governor, they had money. They would, off the demise and the backs of the people, they would build build up wealth for themselves so that they could be fat and rich for the future. So the view of the governors at this time was not positive because the governors, they were just there to make Persia got their money and in return make sure that they got their own money to be taken care of. And Nehemiah begins to say, I have this position 
I have the freedom to do this, but I'm not going to enrich myself at the consequence of others. So for 12 years, he bent over backwards to make sure no one would say, hey, Nehemiah, you know the reason, I bet the whole reason you want to be governor is so that you become rich. No, Nehemiah chose for 12 years to say, I am here to help you to build the wall and to give glory to God. That's why I'm here. Not for my own personal gain. And you can imagine the noblemen, when they first got chastised, they were probably looking for everything to get Nehemiah with. They're like, oh, as soon as Nehemiah messes up, we're going to start rumors. We're going to start saying things. We're going to make sure that Nehemiah suffers like us. And yet, because Nehemiah's moral authority, because he was a man of integrity, there was no fault. I'm sure that doesn't mean he didn't mess up. He made mistakes. But people were saying, okay, we accept that you make mistakes. That's just like all of us. We all have sin. But overall, you are living a life that represents our God in heaven. So for 12 years, he was committed to what he believed and he followed through with what he said. So what do we learn from Nehemiah about moral authority? Well, the first thing is, is I earn moral authority when I walk the talk. I earn moral authority when I walk the talk. When you claim to believe something, and then you begin to live it out in your life over time, it begins to build up like character in yourself and people see that and go, this is a person who says they believe this and, and the way they are living is consistent with that. This helps people know what to expect of you and they know what you're going to be expecting of them as well because you have moral authority. On, on the other end, we have people who don't have moral authority. So let's say these are people with moral authority and because and, they're, they're, they're in alignment with God. So they have moral authority. On the other end of the spectrum, we have people who lack moral authority. They're the people who do one thing and say another. Or you, as a parent, do as I say, uh, not as I do. And because they lack this moral authority, we, we begin to question, do I want to listen to that person? I, don't, I know they may rant and rave and talk and say, we need to do this and this is what you should believe, but we dismiss them because they lack moral authority, because there's no integrity behind their words. I think I'm going to say like moral authority like a hundred times today. But because they lack credibility, We don't look at them. We look at the person who's paid the price. The person whose lifestyle is consistent with what they say. They the next one on your outline is, I gain influence when I have moral authority. I gain influence when I have moral authority. I like this. I read this earlier um, this week. Moral authority determines the degree that people will be open to your influence. I love that. Again, let me read that one more time. Moral authority determines the degree that people will be open to your influence. Teachers, bosses, parents, grandparents... The way you live your life is going to determine the influence you have. Moral authority gives you influence. Your lifestyle aligns up with what you believe. Doesn't mean you have a position where people are going to listen to you, but rather it means that because you're a person of moral authority, a person of integrity, a person of character, people listen to you. It means that when we lead people to Christ, they're willing to listen to us because we have shown to be true. But 
if you lack moral authority and you try to lead someone to Christ, I'm like a <laughs> that person's a hypocrite. They go to church, they know all the right words, they have such and such a position in the church. But do you see how they act? Oh, maybe they don't say bad words, but do you see how they treat people around them? How they use people? They, they don't have an influence on me. I'm not going to listen to them about Christ. So if you want to be a person in your vision that leads people to Christ, you're going to need moral authority. The next one on your outline is, I inspire people when I have moral authority. I inspire people when I have moral authority. When you lack moral authority, it does not inspire people to listen to you. It does not inspire people to, to get excited about the things that you're excited about. But when you have moral authority, it gives you influence. Or even if you lack moral authority, that it diminishes your influence. And this is something that is consistent. Your influence is determined by your moral authority. Now, the most influential person throughout history was Christ. Here's the thing. Here on earth, as far as man was concerned, Jesus had no authority, and yet most of the world, or not most of the world, the, 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 the largest uh, percentage of people that believe in anything are followers of Christ. People who call themselves to be Christians because Jesus had such a huge impact that while he held no position here on earth, he had, one, moral authority, and two, he had influence, and people were changed by his life. Here's what's amazing. Even though he had no position, he wasn't a, a, a king here on earth as far as man was concerned, even though he was not considered like a, a Pharisee or a Sadducee, he had influence, and people listened to what he said. In fact, we're going to go ahead and look at that real quick. At Mark chapter 1, verse 22, it says this, these words about Jesus when he spoke. They were amazed at his teachings, for he was teaching them as one having authority and not as the scribes. As Jesus spoke, he had authority. They went, wow, there's something different about this man. He speaks with authority, and his lifestyle is consistent with how he speaks. He's not like the scribes or the Pharisees. He's different. And then... In the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 18, it says, And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Here's the thing. Jesus actually had a position in heaven. He's God in flesh, so he had authority. But while he was here on earth, he decided to pull back and not let his position influence people, but let his character, his words, his sacrifices, his time be what influenced people. He had moral authority. He decided not to exert his position, but rather let it flow through his character and who he is. It's not your position that influences people in the long term. In fact, if you have a really low position, and yet you have influence, and you have moral authority, then you have the ability to lead people to Christ. So how do you become a person of moral authority? How do we become someone more like Nehemiah? See, this is more like a character study of who Nehemiah is so that we can understand how to be a person who represents Christ. So how do we have this? Well, first, we develop my character. Develop my character. This is a person who does what is right even when it's difficult. This is a person who says, God, you are going to determine what is right. Regardless if I understand it or not, I'm going to trust you because you are the God who determines right and wrong and I am going to follow with your standards. No matter what the rest of the world says, your standards are the highest standards and so that's what I'm going to live for. And so I want to do what is right. Nehemiah chose not to take food. 
He chose not to collect taxes. He chose not to take land for himself because he decided to set that aside because his standard was higher. He wanted God to be glorified. In fact, you can read about it in Nehemiah 5.15. But I did not do so because of the fear of God. He feared God and he said, you know what, I, I, I need to make sure that God is holy. I need to make sure people realize I'm doing this for him and that God loves these people. And I'm going to give up these rights. I think about what... Well, actually, I'll get into that. I think about Paul. We're going to talk about that here. Next on your outline is, is make the sacrifice. Make the sacrifice. And we'll get into this in just a second. If you're a person of moral authority, I'm going to tell you now, there's going to be times in your life where you're going to need to make a sacrifice. It could be financial. It could be time. It could be... Um, uh, blinked on it. It could be power. But there's going to be a time in which you're going to be called to make a sacrifice. I'll tell you now, when we get to the point where we, and we are working on this, when we are get to the point where we say, okay, this is our building plan. This is what we're going to do. And we present it. There's going to be a call for me to say, it is time for us to sacrifice, including my family, for not just for myself, but for us to be able to, to create a building so that we can, one, worship God, two, be a light to our community, and three, use the facility and maximize its ability to reach people around us. And there's going to be a, a call to sacrifice. The right to keep all the money for ourselves. Paul was talking to a church. He wrote a letter to a church called Corinth. And in Corinth we had people that were making sacrifices to idols. And we had some young believers there who saw this these idols and, and they would say you know what I'm not going to eat that meat because that meat was sacrificed to an idol and, and therefore it is tainted in my mind and Paul says look that, that meat in of itself there's nothing wrong with it it's just a, one they sacrifice to a piece of wood which is nothing there's no value in that wood other than just being wood two it's just meat you are free to eat it all you want however however if it's going to cause your brother to stumble, don't eat the meat in front of them. Because they're still working through this process. Give up your right to eat the meat. Make the sacrifice. I know that's a tender cut, and I bet it's good. it would taste really good to eat. But make the sacrifice. Now, if you're like me, and you're a man, a good piece of steak, barbecued, is a wonderful thing to have. So for me to give up a good steak, that's a huge sacrifice. Is there anybody else in here that believes that way? <laughs> Here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your rights does not become a stumbling block to the weak. Don't let it be a stumbling block. Nehemiah knew that by collecting taxes, by collecting land and food, that it would be a stumbling block for the Jewish people who lived around him. And he didn't want to be a stumbling block. And so therefore he chose not to exert his right to collect, but rather to sacrifice. And finally, it's the last one is it's give my time. Give my time. Moral authority takes time. You're going to be giving a lot of time to develop your moral authority. For Nehemiah, it took him 12 years, and God was honored. And you can read about that in, in Nehemiah 5.14. And here is Nehemiah, who it took time, 12 years, for him to have this moral authority. Here's, here's what's crazy though it takes years to build up moral authority it only takes moments for you to lose it all I mean I think about so many pastors that I read about 
who have built up this ministry over years, and because they get caught in adultery, they lose all their moral authority immediately. Not just with the congregation, but with their family, their children, their spouse. I was reading a story about a, a, a man who went to a church and, and he was uh, raising his family in the church and when his kids came to be about 17 years old, he went off and committed adultery with someone else and it created a divorce in the family and it created great strife. And this man who was uh, a, such a uh, center figure of the church and the center of his family who led with moral authority, suddenly he did not realize how quickly he lost his moral authority. So when he's talking to his 18-year-old daughter, he's telling her, hey, I need you, you need to do this, you need to do that, you shouldn't be doing this, and she would not listen to him. So she, he went to the pastor and said, I don't get it. I'm telling my daughter to do this, but she's just being disobedient all the time. She's not listening to anything I say. And the pastor's like, yeah, what you're telling her to do is right, but have you recognized you've lost your position of a moral authority in her life? And therefore, she's not listening anymore. Because it's gone. You may be saying, you know what, I, I, I've probably lost my moral authority. I have made bad choices. And because of that, people aren't going to listen to me. But here's, here's the thing. You can earn back moral authority. Just recognize it doesn't come right away. The first thing you do is you confess. You say, this is what I've done. You confess to God. Then you confess, confess to the people that you hurt. You say, this is what I have done and I am so sorry and I want to bring restitution to this. I will may, never be able to pay you back fully for what I have done, but I'm going to do everything I can for the rest of my life to try to make things right. I'm already forgiven. I recognize that. But right now, I want to do everything that is right. Here's what's amazing. While you may not be able to fully pay back what you've done, you can rebuild your path to moral authority and God will be glorified. And so when people say, you know, let's say five years later, you die. People say, you know what? Yeah, we know he messed up. But the last five years, man, that guy's been on fire for Jesus. That guy's done. That I live a life like that. Not, not where I mess up, but the life where I am fully committed to Christ. And I have built up my moral authority. In my own life, I want to have moral authority. I want to be able to have influence so that I can lead my family to Christ, so I can lead my neighbors to Christ, and I can lead people in this community to Christ. Because my vision here is to see our community come to know the Lord Jesus as Savior and to be his follower. My desire for you as well is that you would live a life that's got integrity. Our authority is, shows through based on your actions. And that people are drawn to Christ because they see that you live differently. What vision has God been calling you to? And what kind of character do you need to be in order to see that vision come through. So our next step is, in what ways are you developing your character? In what ways are you developing your character? What sacrifice is God calling you to make? And finally, where or with who is God calling you to invest your time in? And it may be more than time. It may be finances. It may be power. Oftentimes, the reason I put down time is because we tend to throw money at things. I'm not asking you to throw money at something. I'm asking you to put your time and invest it in a person or group of people. Now I'm going to ask uh, one of the elders to come on forward real quick. What we're going to do is, is a little bit different this morning. I'm going to give the opportunity for um, you to come forward. If, if you want to pray or if you, if you want to, to talk about what's going on in your life every single week, we're going to give you that opportunity to come on forward to talk. And then at the uh, end of the month, 
We're going to do an invitation. If you're like, I just need to commit my life to Christ, or I just need to... Uh, I'm just doing with this in my life. We're going to give an, an invitation where we're going to pray together. But if you're feeling that God, you just need someone to talk with and pray with, um, I'm going to ask uh, Grant if you could come on forward a little bit. If you need someone to pray with, and I'm going to ask you to, to, to speak with Grant. He'll be over here probably on the right. Um, and you could pray with him, and he would be glad to talk with you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to if anybody wants to come forward, you can. If I'm praying and you feel like you need to talk with Grant, then you could come on forward. You could talk with any of the elders here. Don't feel like it's just limited to him. If you're like, I want to talk to, to Dave on my way out or to Bill, or if you even want to talk to me on your way outside, then, then please talk to us. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are just grateful to be here to discover the life of Nehemiah and his character. Let it change who we are and how we live our lives. Let us be inspired by Nehemiah and say, that is the kind of person I want to be. If there is a burden for a person or a group of people, then place it on our heart. Let us see people the way you see people so that we are burdened by it and it changes us. Lord, I want to see this community come to know you. But that change starts first here with us, your followers. So change us first so that we can be change makers in our community. Ones that have integrity, that have influence because of your moral authority that you help us to develop. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.